Yeah, okay, Pastor Kerr put him away neat. I didn't. Oh, hello there. <laughs> Merry Christmas. It's, it, it's like upon us, right? And, and for you special, this great grand weekend, we have the 12 events of Christmas. Number one, today we begin a new series, The Promise of Christmas. Your children have been waiting a while, but the saints had been waiting for centuries. That starts now. Next week, we have Gift of Love, and it is not too late for you to participate, to bring in some gifts, to make some Christmases all that much more sweet. And three, if you've been sniffing around and hanging around Woodman, wanting to find out more, next weekend on Sunday, we've got the Woodman Welcome. Come, meet your campus staff, hear about our church and ways that you could participate even this very Christmas. A new thing this year is our Night of Carols happening on December 14th and December 15th. We've got two nights at our Rock Room and Campus in the Worship Center, an opportunity to sing the songs that mean so much and to focus our attention before the real hustle and bustle begins. Now, if you will not be able to make it to one of those nights, do not worry because we are going to be airing that service on KKTV the afternoon of December 23rd. Uh, that is an amazing opportunity for you to tell a friend that they can get a glimpse of your church and see what it is we are and then invite them to come to service with you on one of our Christmas Eve services, which we will have five of on Christmas Eve. Check your campus listings for when they're happening, but we would love to have you with us. And nine, if you have the bandwidth, if you have some availability, we would love to have you help us pull those services together. If you could serve at one and then attend, if you could serve at two and then attend one, we could use your help. We got a variety of ways for you to get involved and we'd love to have you participate. And then 10, we have no in-person services on Christmas Day. That's a time for you and yours to celebrate. But what we will have is a 30 minute service with singing, some time in God's word, for you and yours to draw your attention to why it is we gather. That service will be available at 8 a.m. Maybe you lead off with it, maybe you don't, maybe it's sometime in the afternoon when the football game slows up, or maybe it's right before Christmas dinner. It will be there. We'd love to have you make use of it. And then 11. 11, camp for Christmas. Be thinking of the students in your life and the gift you could give them, truly the gift that could keep on giving by giving them opportunity to gather with their friends and to, we pray, be impacted by our Heavenly Father. And 12, I'm missing a partridge. I last left him in a pear tree. So if you could find him and let me know, that would be great. Merry Christmas. Pray with us. God bless you. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. So glad that you're here. We are about to kick off our brand new Advent season with a new sermon series called The Promise of Christmas. And so we thought it'd be really, really fitting to sing a song tonight about God's promises and his faithfulness and have all the generations gathered together in the room tonight to do so. So would you guys stand with us and we're going to worship together.
time and time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow out Church, you can be seated.
Good evening. Uh, we're the Herreras. Uh, this is Maddie Virginia, Maritza, Miles, I'm Edgar. And so um, today we are celebrating the second week of Advent. Now, traditionally, Advent is the, prep the season of preparation of Christmas. Um, when we look to the coming of Christ as a baby and the hope that we have, uh, we have in him coming again. Now, Jesus came in, um, in a world that was dark and needed a savior. Now, this, uh, this week, we light up the second candle, which is the uh, candle of faith. And, uh, and we remember that Jesus came into a world of darkness. And we believe by faith that he can, sorry, that he is now with us. And if you find yourself bu uh, burdened uh, this season and in need of faith, find encouragement from the passage in John describing the greatness of who Jesus is. What's it, this page? It's right here. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. As we light this candle, we remember that Jesus, oh my goodness, <laughs> so sorry. just want to make sure we didn't die, um, that we were in need of faith. Good job. Okay, if you guys can stand with us and pray with me. Jesus, we praise you that you are God with us. We pray that you would increase our faith today, bring new people to faith as we share your hope, breathe your spirit on our community, and use to, sh to shine your light in the darkness. Amen. Let's sing this together, church, but our expected Jesus, our Savior. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins, release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength and consolation, hope of all the earth, our world, dear desire of every nation, joy of every lonely Joy to those who long to see the day 
deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever. Now thy gracious kingdom bring, by thine own eternal spirit, rule in all merit praise us to the glorious together church father God in heaven may we soak in the wonder of the gift that you gave to the world the light shining in the darkness the King Almighty the one who would reign forever but came humbly to the earth to walk among us to be with us and to die for us so that we could be redeemed. We love you. We love you, God. We give you glory and praise and honor. And we ask that this Christmas season that you would fill us, fill us with that wonder, fill us with faith in all that you did and in all that you're doing here on the earth and in the promise that you will come one day again Lord, we, we lift these songs to you as our worship. We give our offerings tonight, our tithes, 
as our worship, as our trust in you, the giver of all good things, would you use them to shine your light in the dark world today? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can take a seat. Well, hello, Woodman. If we have not yet met, my name's Josh, and I am one of the pastors here. Allow me to welcome you once more to this second week of Advent and the beginning of a new series that we've entitled The Promise of Christmas. Are you looking forward to Christmas this year? I think your answer, in, in part, I suspect, would be influenced by the kinds of Christmases you've had in the past. Personally, growing up, Christmas was always sweet and a celebration, getting married, being a dad. It's always been a fun time in our home. So I anticipate this December 25th is going to be more of the same. Now, obviously, a lot could happen between now and then that could change it, but, but right now, I'm, I'm expecting celebration. Others of you, perhaps, uh, maybe Christmas has been quite the opposite. You know, maybe your family's a gong show, and you just, you, you, you know what's going to come up. You know already how it's going to go down, and so consequently, you're not looking forward to it. But I mean, between now and then, a lot could actually happen. You might not think it's so, but things could be different this Christmas morning. I'd like us to try, if we could, to imagine for just a moment, how might you answer the question, are you looking forward to Christmas this year, if you had never, ever experienced a Christmas at all? Uh, what questions, what, what thoughts, what would be running through your mind if you'd never experienced a Christmas, if someone just told you, told you about it? There's a tree, there's a story, there's a baby. What would these next weeks look like? Do you think you'd get after it with as much hustle and bustle as you're planning on it? Or might you kind of take a little bit of a slow take? And see how this all plays out. One of the things that I think can be easy to forget is that many of the highlights, many of the things which we consider to be foundational to our faith were at one time future events, unfulfilled promises that people either clung to and acted upon 
or disregarded and did not believe. We look forward to Christmas in large part because we know what it is, because we are confident that it happened. Our Lord and Savior has come. There were many over centuries who had no such confidence. It was just a promise that seemed like it would never be fulfilled. As we prepare our hearts for this coming Christmas, uh, we're going to look at uh, some of the promises God made to his people before the event. Uh, We're going to look at how they responded in real time and how those promises have been fulfilled in the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Hopefully, this will not only teach us a little bit of our history, uh, maybe familiarize ourselves with parts of Scripture we've not thought about in a while, But practically, my prayer is that it will strengthen our faith and our resolve when God seems slow to act upon his promises. We'll take courage and confidence from those who've gone before us and remain steadfast. So with that, if you would, let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of year. And yet we recognize uh, that for some, it's not the season of joy that we might hope it is for them. Uh, We recognize that as much as we uh, can be looking forward to it, a lot can change. We live in a crazy time. Father, I thank you that you have been the sovereign God of the universe forever and that the promises you make, you fulfill And so as we look back, as we go way back, Father, would you teach us from your word? Would you encourage us from it? Would you help me to make no mistakes? Meet with us now, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the first promise that we are going to look at was made to a man named Abram. And his story is found in the Old Testament book of Genesis, which is very easy to find. It is the first book in the Bible, if you would like to follow along with us. And it begins with God creating the world, the highlight of which, the highlight of all creation, was the thing he made in his image, Adam and Eve. Unfortunately, Satan interfered. Satan tempted Adam and Eve. They sinned and in doing so brought death into the world and God expelled them, kicked them out of this perfect, beautiful garden that they had been calling home. Uh, Things generally spiraled downwards from that point. And God decided he had to do like a hard reset and start again and he was going to flood the earth. Humanity was saved through one family, animals that he put on this ark that God told this man Noah to build. Post-flood, humanity began to repopulate, and you'd like to think had figured some stuff out. But sadly, they continue to shoot themselves in their collective feet, and this is where the background This is the background to Abram's story, where it really begins. If you want, turn to Genesis chapter 11, and it starts with a tower. We read in verse 1 of chapter 11, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, if you're new to church stuff or or the Bible, easy to overlook what's happening here. But this is the biblical equivalent 
to like a fifth grader announcing they're going to move out of the home. And if you grew up with this stuff, there is a chance that the Tower of Babel is, is like known more for flannel graph fame, depending on your age, than it is for anything hyper-practical to what we're going through today. Uh, they wanted independence, and they believed it was in their power to grab it. It says that they, 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 they say they're going to build a city ourselves, like the kid. Me do it. We're going to build a tower that's going to go to the heavens. And everyone that sees it, it's just going to be a reminder of how brilliant we are because we built such an awesome tower. And they want glory. They actually say, we are going to make a name for ourselves. People will regard us for this awesomeness that we have done. And they want power. They actually say they don't want to be thinned out. They don't want to separate. They don't want to be dispersed. They want to centralize and grow stronger. Now, the problem with this, though, is that those three things run totally counter to what God had called humanity to do. Rather than be independent contractors on our own, God created us to be in relationship with him, and they are shunning that. Uh, God called us not to receive glory ourselves, but to give glory to him. We were created to bring him glory, and they are not about that. And God specifically had told humanity, I want you to disperse. I want you to spread out. I want you to populate the whole earth. And they're like, no. So God is, is rightly a little frustrated. Take some action. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people, and they, they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do from now on will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Now, first off, any time the Lord uses like a redeemed sarcasm, I think we should point it out. No, notice how they're like, we're going to build a tower up into the heavens. And God's like, oh, is that right? We should go down and check that out. Your, your tower to the heavens is like flights below where we're at. I just think it's always important to appreciate reverent sarcasm. Anyways, the real significance of the passage, I mean, it's only nine verses long. It's easy to overlook. But it highlights again humanity's inability to get out of its own way when left to its own devices as if bringing sin into the world and death was not enough, as if flooding the earth and destroying it was not enough. Here again, they're like, we will do this our way, and we don't need him. They want to live independent of God. They, they want to live for their own glory and in opposition to his commands, and God is like, it's not going to happen. So he brings in different languages. Uh, they can no longer communicate. They are, they, they are at odds. And so they disperse. Now, now put that just in some recess of your mind. Store that for a second. Now we're about to be introduced to the guy who's going to be our leading character. 
Now, if you were to continue on, the author gives a list of descendants from Shem, who is one of Noah's descendants, and cranks all the way down to a guy named Tira, which all I can think of is that cartoon gal, Shira, when I say it. Anyone else? Shira, remember her? Kind of He-Man's girlfriend, but not. They weren't in a relationship. We're not committed. Anyways, I digress. Just trying to lighten you up a little bit. Okay, so Tira, who had three sons of his own, <laughs> one of which is, uh, is our man. Genesis 11, verse 27. It says this. Now, these are the generations of Tira. Tira. Tira fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Now, Haran died in the presence of his father, Tira, in the land of his kindred, in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. Milcah. And the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. Tira took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his grandson and Sarai his daughter-in-law his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Tira were 205 years and Tira died in Haran. Now, again, if, if, uh, this is not like judgy, it's just my own self. So if, if you're doing your quiet time or when I'm doing my quiet time, Reading on your own, these are the kind of sections that I think are easier to read faster. Can I get an amen? Anyone agree? Leave me up here. Like, it's just, it seems like he went there, she did that, and, and it's just like, okay. But it's actually insightful and begins to give us a sense of this man that God is about to call. First off, you could tell Abram, he knew some loss. His brother had died prematurely. It says that his brother died in the presence of his father. For any of you who've lost a child, if you've lost a, a sibling, you, you know that's not something that you ever really get over. It sticks with you. Abram, He's been there. And, and, and then in his own married life, they didn't have any kids. Sarah, Sarah his wife, was, was barren. And, and, and they're, they're older folk now. And so this was no longer the, well, let's wait and see, maybe by next Christmas kind of thing. Uh, this... This dream had passed them by. And we, we want to be kind about the way we say it, but, but Abram's a pagan, right? There's no mention of, of any sort of God experience, and, and we don't want to just judge by a name, because some of us name children weird things. But Sarai was, was the name of the moon god's consort, and, and, and Abram's Sister-in-law was named after the moon god's daughter. And Sarai was, and again, this is back when genealogy, when, when, when humanity was a little more pure, Sarai was, was Abram's half-sister. They had the same dad, but different moms. So you're not getting a particularly orthodox faith experience for Abram growing up. And this dude, he had literally put some miles on in his life. He was born in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is southeast of, of modern-day Baghdad in Iraq. And one day, Tira announces, we're going to move to the land of Canaan. And so they begin this journey and make it some 700 miles to modern-day, the, the south end of Turkey. And it's weird because it says Haran, you're like, well, that's kind of awkward that they like, lose a son and then end up moving to a place named after him. In Hebrew, it's spelled different. It's not the same in Hebrew, but, but in English, it looks like it's the same, but, but it's not. So you have a guy 
who at this point is in his mid-70s, no kids, married to a gal named after the moon god's consort, some 600 miles from Jerusalem, and, and it's this guy, Abram, that God is going to choose to be the father of the Jewish people and the ancestor of Jesus Christ. And there's two kind of takeaways that I'd like to suggest we keep in mind. One is personal, and one is corporate. And corporately, we need to remember that God, pe- God calls people that we don't necessarily expect. If you look at Abram's resume, there's really nothing there that would suggest he's a prime candidate for the job. And we need to keep this in mind because it is so easy for us to look at the world, to see the arrogance, to see the self-centeredness, to see this all-about-themselves mentality, to see them worshiping gods that are not our own, uh, to see them far from what we hold to be true. And yet, by this Christmas morning, God could have called some of them to saving faith in Jesus. God is still at his work. God is still redeeming people that we think he never would. You don't have to raise your hand, but have you forgotten that? Uh, Do you look at people and sort of do like a, a, a judgment sort of call on them? They're close, they're not. If I were to put them in an order, sort of like a salvation kind of draft thing as if we had any control over it. God is at work in this world, and he is calling people to himself. We need to remember that. And then personally, for at least some of you, I would imagine, you could very well be like those who are building a Tower of Babel. You're looking to make a name for yourself, Uh, You have very little regard for for God. Perhaps like Abram, grew up in a family that felt the same. Yeah, sure, things haven't gone perfect. You've probably encountered some heartache and trial along the way. But you're sitting here listening to me, and if I put you on the spot, you would perhaps say, but but, but I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And you don't know it yet. But God is about to break into your life. And and call you to something radically different. And some of you, I believe, are going to respond to him in faith and be radically different by this coming Christmas. Uh, This this is what God does for Abram. This is God's call upon him. Verse 1 says this, "Now, Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, if you are familiar with the story of Abram who becomes Abraham, this is sort of common knowledge, right? But if you could try, as hard as it may be, to erase all that you already know and consider this for a moment from Abram's perspective, this dude is 75 years old. He does not have some co-worker that was always talking about church on Monday morning. He and Sarai had not been like watching The Chosen as a little date night and just kind of exploring what's going on with faith. They have no concept at all of the God of Israel because Israel doesn't even exist. And one day, the Lord pops into Abram's life and says, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. That is the first recorded words we have, and most likely the first words God ever spoke to Abram. Ever. And we really, in our culture, day and age, cannot 
appreciate the gravity of this ask. To leave your family, to, to leave your country, to leave your family, to leave your father's house was to leave any bit of socioeconomic security that you had. And especially difficult, I'd imagine, giving the lack of specificity in the call, go, I'll show you. Imagine a spouse saying that to another. We're moving to another state. Okay, which one? Don't know yet. What, what are we going to do for money? Not sure. Why are we doing this? So there's this God who spoke to me. Which God? I'm not entirely sure. Have you talked to him before? Actually, no. What are we going to do? We're going to go. It really is that crazy. But God really did ask it of Abram. And while you know I hate to let the cat out of the bag, Abram actually obeys. Abram goes. And I think many of us, all of us, I suspect at some time in our life, but maybe some of you now need to recalibrate our expectations of what God may possibly expect of us. It seriously could lead us out of our comfort zone, and it really could be quite vague in a lot of ways. And God has no hesitation in making the request. God could be asking you to really do something. And how? How are you going to respond? Are you ready for that? What would you do in Abram's position? To leave your country, to leave the land which was where you made your wealth, to leave your family which is where you got your security, to go to a place that he has not yet told you where, but to pack up and get moving because he's told you to go. Here's the promise that God made to Abram. Verse 2 says, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's interesting. But God is offering Abram all that the people building the Tower of Babel wanted. Though God's reason for it is really different. He, he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. He, he, he says, I am going to bless you. And he says, I'm going to make your name great. When people speak of Abram, they will be in awe. Why? And God gives the reason so that you, Abram, will be a blessing. This was not solely for Abram's benefit, but so that 
others could be blessed through him. And then God adds on, as you go, Abram, as you do this that I'm calling you to, here's what's going to happen. And he throws out another three. I will bless those who bless you. People who come into your life and bless you, I will bless them in turn for their actions. And secondly, the opposite. Those who curse you, I will curse those who dishonor you. Those who dishonor you, I will curse. And then thirdly, through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's a lot, I think we'd agree, to take in. And, and how does Abram respond? He says, okay. It doesn't ask one clarifying question doesn't bring up the fact that they have no children, that he's 75 years old and and married to a barren woman. Uh, Doesn't ask in what way is he going to be a blessing. Doesn't even say, is there anything more specific that you could kind of give me here? Anything that I have to do, or is it literally just get going Because all God has asked him to do at this point is to go. Everything else in this list are things that God says he will do on Abram's behalf. And Abram obeyed. And in time, God would fulfill all that he said he would. But in some cases, it took thousands of years for the fulfillment to come. We may not notice it, but this really is the first promise of Christmas we have. In what way are all the families of the earth blessed through Abram who would become Abraham? It will be through his direct descendant, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem, who would die, be buried, and rise again for the forgiveness of our sins, that we could be reconciled to God who made us. If you know Jesus Christ by faith this day, you are one of the fulfillments of the promise God made to this man thousands of years ago. And there are two things here as well that I would want us to think about. First is that even today, even today, with this entire book and all the knowledge that we have, even today, the call of God often focuses on outcomes and doesn't offer the specifics we may desire or want to hear. Think about this call. Essentially, I want you to go, I want you to leave everything that you know, and it's going to work out awesome in the end. No addressing the 75-year-old bit. And no mention of the barren wife, no explanation as to how he will bless the world, just a clear expectation of obedience and a future promise it will work out in the end. Are you potentially waiting on God for more clarity to something he's asked you to do and he has no intention of giving you any more clarity on the subject because as far as he's concerned, he's given you enough? Is he asking you, you know that you know you need to stop a relationship. But, you, you, but, but, what you're, but, but if I do, what happens? How long? And, and, and there's, a, there's a host of things he's not told you, but there is something that he has, and, 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 and you've got a choice. Are, are, are you wondering 
about, about church involvement, church participation? Do you have questions about, I don't know how I'm to use my finances or whether I should share the gospel with that friend? Are there a lot of things that you're trying to process and seek understanding on, which from his perspective, I've told you what to do. And I've told you in the end, it works out. How are you, how are you going to respond? Because I'm telling you, God has for a long time been calling people to things. And he doesn't always give them. Not always. A ton to go on. But second, all that God is going to do for Abram is so that he can be a blessing to others. And as you, if you would, continue on in the story of this man, you would see some foibles like you and I, some like really easy passes that you're like, how did he drop those? Some crazy, crazy, crazy decisions that he has made. But you would also see a consistent pattern of interceding, stepping in, taking risk to meet and to help other people. You see a heart that yearns for people to be safe. You see a heart for someone who values human life. You see a guy who really did want to be a blessing. And yet what is phenomenal is for as much as the guy did, the real impact of his decision would come thousands of years later through the birth of Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing God gives Abram is for his sole benefit only. And I will tell you that this be a blessing vibe hasn't changed in the thousands of years since. Even Jesus Christ would say, I, Jesus said, I did not come to be served. And I'm Jesus. Even I did not come to be served, but to serve and offer myself up as a ransom for many. And if you are new to church stuff, and if you are cynical, I will concede that there are those outside who can claim our faith and don't seem to be very nice about it. But you are in a church, you are in a room and rooms with people who really take this to heart and put themselves out for people. We might not get to bless all the families of the world, but next weekend we're going to bless a few gift of love, I want to just thank you as as one of the pastors here to see the generosity of this church. It does so much for my heart. Because we can say things from the front, but it's your participation that gives veracity to the things that are said. And if you're like me, and haven't participated yet in Gift of Love this year, good news is you still have time to do it. And we actually could use, we need gifts for like kids 8 to 18. And that, I don't know, it's it's that awkward teen thing. Find a teen, ask them what do you want, don't get it for them, and get it for someone else. (laughs) Just, Just find out what that thing would be. Go on Amazon, have it delivered. We just need them by Wednesday so we can sort that all out. And particularly if you're at the Heights campus, we still need a few people to serve. And so you could just like bring a collective ah, moment of relaxation to the ACT staff. If you would just like go right now, not right now, wait a minute, but go in a minute and, and tell them that you could be involved to help be a blessing. And it may seem like a small thing. But God's people have always been called to be a blessing to others in small and big ways. Has God perhaps blessed you specifically for that purpose, that you could bless someone else? It's our decision 
Abram in time will become Abraham, and he will become Abraham, the physical father of the Jewish people. But the Apostle Paul sees something much more significant at work in Galatians chapter 3. Just listen to this. Verse 7, know then that is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. When you and I, or should you, confess Christ as Lord, believing that God raised him from the dead and inviting him to forgive your sins, you and I become the spiritual descendants of the man that we have looked at today. Imagine an an exhausted Abraham and Sarah, their young son Isaac running around, still just the three of them. And Sarah may be asking, like, I don't know, they're having tea and like scones or something. Honey, what did he say again? Baby, he said, through us, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's what he said. I don't know how he's going to do it. But I believe. Do you? Do you believe that day we're going to celebrate on December 25th is not just a day? It's the day when we proclaim that our Savior has come, and he is the hope of the world, and he is still about his work. What might Abram and Sarai say to you today if they could get you for five minutes? Would they look you in the eye and say, son, I will tell you he's not quick, but he's faithful? Would he tell you, daughter, trust him? He will not let you down. Would it be an invitation for you to become a part of his spiritual family if you have been waiting on God for something? It may be this Christmas he gets it done. It may not be. The question always is, not what is he going to do, But are you and I going to be faithful until he does whatever it is he has planned? Abram was. I hope that trait has made it down to us. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for just this great demonstration of obedience, of trust against all odds. And I ask that you would give us more of the same. Father, perhaps for someone here, it's to take that step of, for the first time, putting, putting all their eggs, uh, putting, p- putting all the chips on that Jesus square and confessing him as Lord and inviting him to forgive them of their sins. Uh, Maybe for us, we've been waiting, we've been longing, we've been wondering what you're up to. And we need to remember that the God we read of in your word is the God that we worship here today. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. May that ring true in our hearts and be displayed through our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling
calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. God is a faithful God, and we stand secure 
on his promises, and then we are able to go in, in confidence, because not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And what just struck me as, as I was listening, as I was looking at the scripture, is of, as God's faithfulness. But the reality is God still uses us. He uses you to point others to his faithfulness. And, and so it just stirred in my heart how God might use me, God might use you this Advent season, this Christmas season, to help introduce those who are right now dead in their sin. They are far from God. But yet this December, they're going to be made new. They're going to be made alive in Christ. And that's because you took a risk. You went. You went to your neighbors. You went to your coworkers. You went to your friends and said, hey, I'd love you to join us. I'd love you to come with me and hear about this, this God, hear the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so I would encourage you now, over the days, over the weeks ahead, be praying for that one person, that one family member, that one neighbor, who is it God's calling on you that you might think will never say yes, but the reality is they're just waiting to be invited. And we never know what God is going to do. Our God is faithful. So whatever you may be facing, uh, a medical diagnosis, a relationship difficulty, financial strife, whatever it is, if we could pray for you, we would love to join with you in prayer. And we're going to have pastors and leaders up front. But as you head out into this Saturday evening, let me read these words over you. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen and amen. Go in his grace. Go to his peace.